Welcome to Stephanie's Mars Stream. This is our first show that's gone twice. I can't believe it, but since last Thursday, we this is our eighth show at Mars Stream. And it's been going incredibly well. And I wanna thank you and welcome you all to this show tonight, where in a few minutes, I'll start interviewing Josh, Josh Kornbluth. But I wanna tell you more about what's going on. Starting tomorrow night on Friday, believe it or not, we have our first bingo game. Bingo with Josh again. It's like a, a Josh Marsh Alusa. He had a Papalalusa, or however you said it, but this is like a Marsh Alusa this weekend. And we're going to play bingo with Josh. And I think you should join us because, you know, this could be the best bingo game you ever saw trying. The, for the with the march trying to play bingo on zoom lord knows what might happen and i think it's going to be fun whether we really have problems or not because it's going to be incredible and then we have josh's uh, sh uh movie on saturday and sunday nights we have set from starting tonight actually all the way through sunday we're going to see the fabulous mathematics of change and we'll talk to Josh about that a little bit later. And we're back with the Monday Night March. And I just want to say, oh, and on Friday, believe it or not, we have our first noon show, the premiere of our noon show. And this is CJ's <coughs> fitness sing, singing lessons and fitness. Where else but the marsh? And following another new show next Thursday, because we all wanna learn how to be good and do things well on this Zoom platform and this small box platform, Don Reed will be giving us some tips and there'll be a Q and A. So that's next Thursday at noon. So are you all ready? Are we all ready to welcome Marsh to our Zoom stage? Yes, let's have a big, Hand shaking for Josh Cornbluth. Woo! And you are no longer muted. Yes, thank Excellent. you. Excellent. I so once, I once when I long time, long long time ago, I interviewed Robin Williams, and uh, and uh, for San Francisco Magazine, and I told him that I was in this movie with him. Uh, even though he wouldn't know it because I had a much smaller part than he did. There's this movie uh, called Jack, where he played a little kid who looked like a 40 year old man. Cause, and um, so I told him, I said, uh, I, I told him, Robin, you know, it, I mean, I ended up playing a cigarette pack, but an operational cigarette pack, but you know, at a costume party, big costume, but I really wanted to, uh, what I asked to be was, um, uh, I, I asked to be an ice pick and, uh, and they didn't let me. So um, I wanted to reenact a whole year, uh, Stalin era uh, assassination and with Trotsky. And uh, and I was denied. So he said, and he just said really fast, this is how fast he is. I said, and they didn't let me do it. He said, you were filtered. Just like that. <laughs> like the cigarette pack. Yeah, it's just so fast. He is. Yeah. And you he know, yeah. Josh, because you wrote that article you also told him about the Marsh's Mock Cafe. Oh, that's back. right. And then he came to the Marsh because I recommended it. Right. For like I've been a, a, I've been a really, I, I think even before the term influencer was, you know, in common use, I was an influencer. Well, at least for the Marsh. Yes. In that one occasion. At least on many occasions. And, and in fact, um, Robin Williams came almost every weekend to the Mock Cafe to, and he performed there for almost a year. It was unbelievable. And he was unbelievable. I remember one night he came in and my dad was there with his very bald head. And he came up to my dad and he took my father's head and he just started to riff on my father's bald head. I was so glad my father did not, he was laughing so hard, my dad. I was so glad he didn't have a heart attack in <laughs> the moment. It was incredible. Robin would have worked with that too. He would have worked the heart attack into his routine. It would have been it would have been really funny. Still, he was a, a lovely, brilliant, genius guy, wasn't he? 
He was wonderful. He was so nice to all the comics in the Mott Cafe. And the first, oh, this is the best story. I don't know. I must, anyway, the best story is the first night Robin Williams came to the Mock Cafe, which held about 12 people. And there was a big pole in the way at the time. Mm -hmm. Now it's our elevator. But anyway, uh, he came and, and Mike, the host, told Robin Williams that he could only go on for five minutes. So I told, I couldn't believe that when I heard it. And I said, you know, Mike, I think number two things, as soon as Robin Williams show up, I, you need to call me so I can come down and watch. I, I lived in Oakland at the time. And number two, I said, you can let Robin Williams go on for as long as he likes. And he would, he would go on for 40 minutes. It was just incredible. But he only went on for, he was very polite. He only went on for five minutes that first time. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, Robin may, may have been a big wig in the stand-up comedy and feature film and television worlds, but at the Marsh, he was just a beginner, and he had to pay his Marsh dues. <laughs> it's, a, it, uh, it, it's, just, it's not just so simple, you know, that all of a sudden you have 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, Josh, speaking of Marsh beginners, not that you were ever a beginner, I, I think you... Yeah, I was. <laughs> I don't, so, you know, Josh and I audience, Zoom audience, have been working together for over 30 years now. And Josh first came, maybe it was under 30 years. Anyway, Mr. Math, it's, it's, Mr. It's, math Man. It's 30 years. It's been 30 years exactly. Went, wait, I'm sorry? It's been 30 years exactly. It's when 1990. When was the first time you did it? You were, the first time. The first March I did was in 1990. And, and it was at Morty's and at Morty's in North Beach at Morty's restaurant where the performances were punctuated by the ding, ding, ding of the cash register at the bar. And it was uh, it was very romantic. It was great. And I was thrilled. I was thrilled. It, it was it was such a, a huge thing for me because I was working. I was starting to work on my show that became a show called Haiku Tunnel. And uh, uh, I was working as a legal secretary at the time. And then I'd had this sort of problem with mailing out letters for my boss. And I decided I wanted a riff about that. So I did that at the Marsh for, I got my 20 minutes and I talked about, well, how I hadn't mailed out these really important letters for my boss. And, you know, I talked about it and talked about it. And then at the end of my 20 minutes, I came off stage and someone in the audience asked me, well, did you mail them? And I thought, it's grabbing them. <laughs> it, it works. It's, they're interested. So. That was that was my first great Marsh experience. Well, I I remember, or is this just a Marsh Josh Cornbluth urban question, or did you just tell me this to kind of make sure you got your the first run the Marsh ever did? Was that those that first letter, the thing that inspired it was the fact that you wrote me a letter to get up. <gasps> That's there. right, I forgot. Tell them that. <laughs> I forgot. Okay, so here's the deal lovely Zoom people, uh, is um, is that, okay, so I was working as a secretary. I was working at Pillsbury Madison and Sutro, which had the unfortunate acronym of PMS, but they called it PM and S. So, you know, no one would ever think of that. And then and then I changed it in my piece to the fictional Skylar and Mitchell or S&M. Okay, so, but what I actually did at the real PMS is I came in on the weekend and I, I was trying to print out a letter to send to Stephanie Wiseman asking if I could perform at the Marsh. And I hit print, but the thing is, it's this huge law firm, right? And I hadn't initialized my printer. And the last, it, it short story, which is tough for me, it ended up printing the letter to Stephanie Wiseman, which said basically, dear Stephanie Wiseman, I'm a horrible secretary. I haven't mailed out these letters for my boss. No one knows about it. And I'd like to start performing about it at the Marsh. And instead of printing out at my printer at my station, it printed out in another building, in, an, in a lawyer, the, the office of a lawyer, this woman lawyer I had never met for some reason. And so I had to break into the building um, and break into her office. And then just to, the story continues in, in the actual, what became the show Haiku Tunnel and then the movie Haiku Tunnel. But, and then the woman came in, you know, whose office it was and seemed to assume that I was a lawyer because of, I guess, my age and my gravitas and stuff. And so I allowed her to think so for quite a while. Did you but anyhow, that really was, yes, so it's all Marsh related. 
Yeah, you know, it's like this weird muse relationship, Josh. It's a weird muse relationship. I am weirdly, in very small ways, your muse. But didn't in the Haiku Tunnel mo movie, you ended up dating her, right? Yes, or at least having we're really getting we're getting into a really tricky territory of you know what you know what's real, what's not real. You know, with with all my shows, I, I make a point of saying that they're fictional. But with Haiku Tunnel, I actually begin by saying it's fictional because it involves attorneys, and uh, you know who tend to litigate things and stuff. But I will go so far as to say that I went on at least one date with the woman lawyer who came in, who was in the criminal division, which was even scarier. <laughs> Well, because I was a criminal and am. Well, in that moment, you were a criminal. Did you actually get the letter back? Of course I got the letter. And then you got it, right? Well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, because you booked me. Yeah, I booked you, right? Yeah. But how could I not? Mm -hmm. All you had to do was show your beautiful Punam face. And I would have booked you, Josh Kornbluth, in a moment. And I did. So, <laughs> okay. So that I feel like you're the, you're the mom I never had, Stephanie. Like the warm kind of mom, <laughs> the nurturer. I'm sorry, my mom is great. I love my mom. She's 92. She's great. Just uh, a Stalinist and a little bit, a little bit, a little bit unyielding emotionally. <laughs> but enough about me, which well, no, it might stay on my tombstone. <laughs> it's all about you, Josh. So. So if we go farther down the line, then you ended up doing, look, you want to talk about your, your early moments beyond that first moment at the Monday Night Marsh, which my I remember early... we ended up going to my apartment and I got you some yin chow because you had thought you were coming down with a cold. Really? I didn't actually remember that part. I, I that, that's a... <laughs> Did anything else happen that night, Stephanie? Can we, t and if, if there is, if the answer is yes, can we take that offline later? Because I have no memory <laughs> of anything after the performance. Well, I don't remember anything either, Josh. So let's go on. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, I get that a lot. So tell, so tell, uh, tell us more about those beginning dates and what happened. Well, um, I just, you know, I kept working at, at as a secretary, and that was my second piece. I'd done my first piece uh, the year before in 1989, uh, which was called Josh Cornblue's Daily World and ended up later being sort of transformed into Red Diaper Baby, the piece of his Red Diaper Baby. And I started that one also in North Beach, around the corner from Morty's, at a place called uh, Enrico Banducci's Hungry Eye, Hungry Id. He called it Hungry Id, Enrico Banducci's Hungry Id. It was in the basement of a restaurant in which Enrico Banducci was the cook. And he, he booked me there. And um, people came because they thought it was the hungry eye. You know, they, they would come in thinking that they would see a strip show. <laughs> and then they saw me on stage doing improvisations about my communist family. And, you know, some were turned on. But I think uh, mostly they, they felt they'd made a mistake at that point. <laughs> And so I did that and then performed and then developed that. Um, and then that's when I started with, um, late in that run. I think I started working with David Ford, which is another incredible turning point for me. And uh, so he, David was my first, yes, because David Ford's w wife, uh, Ann Dara, the transcendently great actress, um, I was there seeing a show that she was in. And, um, and then, I like just was hanging out and like David Ford was hanging there. I said, hi, I'm Josh, I'm David. And I said, I said, what's going on? I said, well, I'm a solo performer, but I really could use a director. <laughs> he went, well, I'm a director. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's a cool world, the theater world, Bay Area. And, uh, and so then after I did that first run, then I was working on the show Haiku Tunnel and I started working at the Marsh and then the Marsh, I kept working on it, right? The Marsh moved to Cafe Bino. Great. Uh, in, in, on Valencia Street, Bino also being, I believe, a uh, liquid that you can buy in Australia to reduce the anguish of gas. I think or maybe you can, you can buy, buy it, it here. You can buy it anywhere. You can buy Bino anywhere? Anywhere. Okay, cool. So I don't know if there's any relation, if that came, they got the idea from seeing me or what. And then, um, and then, right, we did, uh, and then 
you'd been having a whole bunch of us do our like 20 minute sets, which is great. And you decided you were gonna have the first run at the marsh and it would be a piece that had been developed entirely at the marsh, uh, that had been developed at the marsh, which was also uh, directed by David Ford and who collaborated with me. And um, and so and that was at Cafe Bino and that was great. That was, that was, that was like one of my great experiences performing. Cause it was also, I was still a secretary I was still a really bad secretary. I was still, you know, struggling and stuff like that. And at the time, the mission, I understand the mission has had some changes <laughs> since I lived there uh, 20 some years ago. But at the time, it was really a lot of bohemian sort of working class kind of stuff. And, and then the people who came to the marsh, you know, so basically it was all temps in the audience. It was like, all, it was all temps who were aspiring to be solo performers there'd like be 120 of them you know and um and so it was just a perfect audience i was talking about their life to them from their perspective so it was uh it was awesome uh do you remember the time so the way the cafe bino set up which is now cafe ethiopia it's still there on valencia but the at the time there was the back room which we were in and then there was the cafe behind it and they were making a lot of noise in the cafe one night while you were performing and you stormed out of the theater and you told them, do you remember this? During the show? During the show. Yeah, sounds like me. You stormed out and you told them to be quiet, that you were performing. Do you remember this? And that they were all dressed in black and they looked really good. I told them they were all dressed in black and they looked really good? Yeah. Well, it's good. I poured a little sugar there. When, when yeah. I don't remember that at all, but those things tend to, there tends to be a lot of noise when I have important performances. Um, in those early days, in, I would perform at Laval's Subterranean uh, in Berkeley, uh, Laval's North Side, and it's a pizza place and they would pay me in pizzas. And um, which is why I look the way I look today. Otherwise I'd be really thin and, and really just gaunt even. But, um, but they would be ro constantly rolling. You would hear the, cause it was in the basement too. And you'd hear barrels of the beer rolling along. And then they, like you'd be doing this thing about, and then my father had a stroke and I was traumatized. And then you'd hear like over the loudspeaker, number 86 with pepperoni, you know? And, and so it was, it was a challenge, you know? But again, those are the dues that I paid that Robin Williams hadn't. You know. you know, not to get into the nitty gritty or anything, but to get in the nitty greedy. How many pizzas did they pay you to do your <laughs> show? And was it just on the night of the show or could you come in all week and get pizzas? Oh, no, I wasn't like a star. Like a star could maybe come in and just say, give me a pizza. But no, I'm not a star. So it was just I got a pizza per performance. So, so it you know, was one it was, pizza per performance. As I recall, this is a while ago, but yes. <laughs> if it was me, I would have remembered because I remember everything, I think. You you seem to, I think you should write my memoirs, which is weird because so. I'm in the business of doing autobiography. So, uh, okay. So we're to Haiku Tunnel. Shall we move along? And then you did that. You did it at the Marsh. And then... Then, then, I, then I did a... a are we sort of going through and then did a, a show called The Moisture Seekers. Now, uh, what did you, did you do that at the Marsh? I can't remember. <laughs> now you can't remember. You know why? Because it was about sex. So obviously I made a huge impression on anyone who saw it at the Marsh. And I remember everything regular. about the show, but I don't remember. You did it at the Marsh, didn't you? I'm not sure. I know that I worked on it in various places, but um, it was very traumatic to work on. <laughs> it was really traumatic. I don't know. I just thought, you know, well, if you do autobiography and comedy, you're supposed to talk about like early sexual experiences, right? It's like written into the contract or something. <laughs> so I would, I was just so embarrassed, you know, I was like, I would go, <laughs> go out and improvising. Like, I mean, it's not like I had billions of sexual experiences to describe <laughs> to the audience, but I, you know, I had a few. And, and so I would, I'd be describing, and I remember like I was doing to one audience, it was all, and this is, you know, it was like all, there were about eight of them. And uh, it was somewhere south of market. Uh, they were all over 80 or 90 and they were all Jewish. And two things happened in that improv. One is that I repeatedly had my Yiddish pronunciation corrected in real time. 
And the other thing was that when I got too embarrassed talking about a sex thing and I couldn't go on, this lady in the front said, oh, come on, Josh, we've seen everything. So I remember that audience very fondly too. You know, I have to say over the years, especially in those early years where, I don't know if you did the Moisture Seekers at the Marsh or not, we're gonna have to go look, but I'm sure you improv it. And I used to be so thrilled I would come to every improv you did and you did a heck of a lot of them. And this was Thank at you. you know our current space in the beginning back in 1992 when we first moved in there. And I would watch you with such, like sometimes it would take you like an hour to hit. <laughs> it's the moment of brilliance. I know sometimes, yeah, people people would like, <laughs> you sort of, I see you so excited, like, no. He doesn't suck forever. At some point, he starts getting good. <laughs> it might not be till tomorrow's show, but really, you should stick around. Did I say that or did you? I just imagined you saying that. And Yeah, no. Oh, you imagine? It was true because I would sit at my edge of my seat and I would be staring really close at you. And I'm going, when is he going to hit? When? Well, it's an improvisation. But you always okay. would, even though you, and you would keep at it. You were so... You had such, such, for whatever. Nachas? Is Nachas a, a word that could be used? Yeah, probably. Okay, yeah. cool. But you would, you would just keep at it until you hit. And sometimes it would be hours. And or I days would, or months. Well, no. I mean, The I mathematics know. of change actually took, remember how we did, how many that was, that came up uh, later on, but the mathematics of change. Remember, I was, we didn't have a blackboard, so I was drawing on the back wall I, with chalk. But then <laughs> it was a black hole, but then it couldn't be erased or something. So between every improv, someone repainted the wall, as I recall, the back wall. And so it seemed like a lot of, maybe in retrospect, it would have been easier to like borrow a <laughs> blackboard. <laughs> but I remember I did so many of those things and I knew that like math and calculus and my dad and my dad telling me I'd be a great mathematician as well as a great communist leader. I, I knew there was a show in there with math tricks and stuff, but I wasn't getting it. <laughs> and I, I remember I was trying to illustrate at some point in an improv Zeno's paradox um, by going really slowly. <laughs> I'd be like the, I guess the, the tortoise. I'd be going like really slowly trying to reach that point where you're going so slowly that you're not moving at all, which was excellent theater, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Josh, since we're talking about the mathematics of change, and was that the right word? Yeah, anyway. Yeah. And we're starting it, we're gonna unlock the passcode at 8.30, which has gotten everybody really confused. But we will unlock that passcode. Not or only you, you will unlock. I it. will unlock the passcode. I, I will unlock it on this very screen. Right. We're going to do it right at the end of the show, and you all can start watching this fabulous concert per concert performance from now until Sunday at eleven fifty nine, which means at midnight. We don't know if it's Sunday or Monday, so that's why we put down eleven fifty nine. So you can watch it all this time, this wonderful show, until Sunday at 11.59 p.m. p.m. Yes. Uh, yeah. a.m. You don't have to do until it. Until the end of, end of the weekend. By yeah. the end of the weekend. So tell us a little bit about this show that people are about or can, will see. Uh, so uh, the Mathematics of Change, did I originally do it? Maybe 1994, not sure. Um, and, uh, it was a piece, uh, this was the, it, this came after I had gone to New York, uh, at second stage and had a sort of an off Broadway success with Red Diaper Baby, uh, with my show Red Diaper Baby. And then it had been optioned, uh, by a couple of students, Red Diaper Baby was optioned by Universal and then Miramax optioned, um, uh, Haiku Tunnel. And then both of the ones to turn around. So like two years <laughs> later, like I had two years where I was like, I have an agent <laughs> at William Morris and, th and then is I don't have an agent and they fired my agent. And that's about where I was when I decided I was gonna try to do a piece about math. And, um, and that's all as usual, I just start with an idea, which is I'm gonna do a piece about math. And, and then I start improvising. And uh, my dad was a math teacher in middle school. 
and we did math tricks together all the time. And I was very proud. He would drill me in my timetables, times, times tables. And, um, and it also, there was something to me about, I just felt really evocative to me about, I was really good at math in high school. Excuse me, I was really good at math in high school. And math in high school for me went through pre-calculus, trigonometry, and then a little more. Calculus, which I took my freshman year at Princeton, it changes all of a sudden, like the world changes. I mean, your world changes because it's about curves. It suddenly isn't about you know straight lines and, 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 and sharp angles, it's about curves and it involves approaching limits and differentiation and, and integration. And it involves, to me, an enormous leap of faith, you know, to believe that 0 0.9999999 equals one. And <laughs> I never could get myself to believe that. And for that, and also because everyone else was smarter than me in the math department, I, you know, ended up not doing well in math and going into other things. But the idea of it to me is also just that well, it's about adulthood leaving home, you know, and leaving home and thinking, you know, who you are, you know, or, or you're actually, no, I was excited to become the person I was going to become, which I thought was going to be, I'd been told by my dad that it was going to be excellent in every way, the person I was going to become and very successful. <laughs> and, um, and then immediately freshman year, I failed uh, at among other things, calculus. And I think, uh, I, I still find it really evocative that that there's a different way of thinking that I had to get to in order to uh, in order to be able to do calculus in order to be a grown up uh, as much as I can be a grown up in order to uh, evolve uh, somewhat away from my parents politics. Um, so, yeah, and so I ended up uh, working on that piece with uh, my friend John Bellucci, B-E-L-L-U-C-C-I. Uh, who amazing, I don't know if any of you guys, any of you Zoom people saw him, saw John when he was performing. He was the original Roy Cohn in the original Eureka production of Angels in America. Um, he was rehearsing for that with Ann Dara when I was working with David Ford on the Haiku Tunnel. So John and John is a great actor and writer and everything. And so, but he, I got him to direct me. And so he directed me in this and I did my improvs and stuff. And then um, it opened it. Remember every year there was the Solo Mio Festival that used to happen and it opened then. The Solo Mio Festival was cool because Spalding Gray would always be the obvious headliner. And then they would make people this, you can't see Spalding Gray unless you see some of these other schmucks. You gotta buy, you gotta buy five tickets and only, <laughs> you can't just see Spalding Gray. So you had a lot of people who are sort of forced to see people like me, it was cool. You know, this brings me to one of the things I put in my newsletter today that we might talk about the dog story. And the I dog story. Oh, also, this isn't really the time or the place, but I haven't received the last two newsletters. So just but I if you, to you, I forwarded if, to you. Today. If you know anyone, if you know anyone at the marsh who's in a position of influence, I beg you to put me back on the list. Well, I did forward it to you. Do you hear that music playing? No. Oh, you can't. It's my wife's uh, <laughs> ukulele. She got a, we got a ukulele app that you tune your ukulele and you learn ukulele, which is weird because neither of us really plays ukulele. I guess at the time we were optimistic about becoming ukuleleists. And so at eight o'clock every night at 8 p.m., it plays the same tune. Do, 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 do. It's supposed to sort of sound like a ukulele. <laughs> and she's kept hers on. Like this has been years now. That's an issue between, that's a, uh, that's a marriage issue and I shouldn't have brought it up, but anyhow. Does she play the ukulele? No. She just keeps it on. She, there's a certain thing in our family and our son is this way too. Sometimes like in a peculiar way, we like to keep things the same, like constant. So if there is a ukulele app and if it always plays this same irritating tune at 8 p.m., it seems best not to tempt God by taking off the ukulele app. Especially <laughs> because now. in the previous days that we had the ukulele app, we lived through, we survived. And so perhaps by, by the grace of the ukulele app, uh, I'll make it through today as well. That's good. 
I might be putting too much emphasis on the ukulele app at this point in our conversation. I don't know, but this is a real insight into my thoughts and my feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. So I'm going back to that time when you had two films and you had some money, remember? I had money. I, it, I paid off my student loans. It, they but, were shocked. They were shocked. They were everyone sh was shocked. I paid everybody. And not only did you pay everyone, but remember the dogs and going to the pet store and you bought everything for those two dogs, one of which I kept and the other one you kept? Okay, so the dog story. The dog story. So the dog, yeah. So so I, I think I ran into you on the street, was it? Or did you come to my apartment? I don't know. We it, lived a few blocks away from each other. I came to your apartment with the dogs because I, I was at the time living dogs. literally around the corner from uh, on, on Hill Street, around the corner from where the marsh was then and is still. And then you were living a few blocks down. Right. I Valencia was Street. Elizabeth. So you showed up with these two like really sad ass dogs. I mean, these dogs were just so depressed. And also, as we learned, flea ridden. And, um, and you told me this thing that they've been and you'll say it better because you were the one who experienced it, but you told me that like they've been running in the street, like just right. running in the street, these two dogs. And we captured them. Yeah. And we went over. Oh, to you told me about the dogs and then we went and captured them. And then you took one dog and I took another dog. Exactly. And my dog's name, my, <laughs> my, my, my dog's uh, name was, I believe, Tara. Um, no, no, it was, it was, uh, what? Taco? No. Uh, the sauce? Salsa. No, that right. was your dog. You had the white, it was a pr totally white dog named Salsa. <laughs> that was mine or yours? Yours in the mission, I believe. In Mar Sarah, do you remember? Do you remember what the little dog, or did I know you? <laughs> you didn't know her yet. You knew me when I had Tara, right? Yeah, see, because it became a thing because Tara, um, Tara really got attached to me because as we learned, these dogs had not had a really happy life uh, till that point. And um, so like to the point that she wouldn't let me go into the bathroom without her. Um, she, uh, you know, we became very close. And the thing is, I was then, you know, dating my now wife, but uh, then girlfriend, Sarah, S-A-R-A, and then there was this dog who was getting very, very <laughs> fond of me named Tara. And um, it just seemed like the recipe was there for a, a horrible, you know, triangle. But, yep. um, but then what happened? You found, we found out who owned the dogs. Well, what happened was this. What happened was you had to perform the night that we had the dogs, right? Yeah. And that's actually when you met David Fuchs, because I gave the dog to David Fuchs to hold on to during your improv. Right, because the dog wanted to come on stage with me. Right. So he held him and he actually gave us our first check, but I gave it back because we weren't a nonprofit. But the funniest thing was I didn't have my dog anymore because even though you had bought us all this stuff with your money, right? And we tried to give them baths, you went home. We did give them a bath in your apartment, fortunately, not right. mine. Yeah. We went home, we split up. And I decided I didn't like my dog. So I that I didn't like my dog. The you dog didn't like Salsa. But just think of it. It's a white dog named Salsa. She's going to have issues. So Salsa and I went on Valencia. It's like naming me McClurry or something. Exactly. It's just going to be like, why? I don't look right for that name. I don't. Exactly. Yeah. So I took the dog to Valencia Street. And I was walking down Valencia Street. And this guy came up to me on a bike and said, what a beautiful dog. And I said, you want it? <laughs> he said, yes. So he took the dog and within a block, which we find out later, the dog got into a terrible fight with another dog and he had to bring it to the, the vet hospital. <laughs> and yeah. then I'll give the story back to you. Yeah, I don't remember actually. I think the way the upshot was that we discovered somehow where the dogs came from. Well, and we knew they that came... to begin with. We knew that to begin with. because oh, we, we did? Tried... Oh, I that's tried... right. You, we, we tracked it and because it, it, it had dog tags, which is the first time I ever connected dog tags with dogs. <laughs> I thought, you know, dog tags, like in the army, like my, when my dad had a World War II, and then this dog has a dog tag. <laughs> and then I sort of worked it out. But yeah, so you found, the, you went to the address and a teenage girl, very sullen, imagine this, a sullen teenager, answered the door and said, 
we don't want them, slam the door. So it turns out that her parents, both judges, or did was one parent a judge? Maybe one. One parent was a judge. They left town for the weekend, leaving Salsa and Tara with their teenage daughter, who just let them out into the street, which is when you found them and refused to take them back. Yeah. And then what happened? Then we got to a big thing about it because the guy I gave it to was a paralegal and he knew who the judge was. And then we all had to give him back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't, you remember so many of the, if, if, if I remember details from my life, like you remember details from my life, my shows would be way better and more I specific. Help. I'll help you. Don't Thank worry. Thank you. Okay. So did you want to read anything, any excerpts or was that the ex from anything? Oh, sure. I can. Yeah. Um, yeah, you told me I should do excerpts. Well, so you I'll don't do... want it's only if you want to because I'm like a really easy hostess. Okay, cool. Well, why don't I do like the opening line from three different pieces? Incredible. Okay. Um, this is the opening line for Ben Franklin Unplugged. And this is how I do, like I can usually roll out of bed and do like one any of my eight shows, kind of. Uh, I just have to know what remember what the first line is. <laughs> so I know if it's the one about. Anyhow, this is the one about Ben Franklin, Ben Franklin Unplugged. I love my mother, and I'm pretty sure that my mom loves me. But that doesn't mean there's never been any tensions between us. That's the opening of that. So immediately taking the, the focus away from Ben Franklin, one of the great people in history, to me, to me. Uh, so accomplishing that, Let's see, love and taxes. Um, some time ago, I had sort of an insight into myself. Actually, it was kind of a two-part insight. The first part was a realization that the central challenge in my adult life was to be able to figure out how to love a woman with the same depth and intensity with which I had loved my father. That was the first part. Yeah. That is pretty deep. <laughs> and then uh, Citizen Josh, um, yes. I know what you're thinking and I feel you. You're thinking, Josh, why tell a story about democracy of all things? Isn't democracy over? And by the way, that opening line and that whole piece still feels really relevant to this very moment. <laughs> More relevant. Yeah. Is that it? Well, those are three opening lines I could okay, do. Okay, I wasn't keeping track. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's go toward your future right now because you've made this massive change turnaround You've become an incredibly, like, I'm sure you were always that, but it's more obvious now that you've been a, an incredibly good human humanitarian person. And now really? you're working in such things as the Zen Hospice and, right. and, and this, this other place. Tell us. But it about all came through performing, like, all the time. It did. When I was... Uh, I was invited uh, several years ago to do a benefit for the Zen Hospice Project because uh, they were funding when they did their benefits for rich people that they would start to talk about the hospice and people would get really bummed out and then leave before giving any money. So they wanted me to, I guess, bring the lighter side to you know hospice. And so I visited the hospice for the first time and met my first dying person and uh, loved her and then ended up becoming um, their visiting artist. And then uh, I, I was... Uh, a volunteer there for about three years. It's um, the most beautiful experiences of my life. And um, and then, and even though I will admit to my Zoom friends here, we had a little meditation session at the beginning of each shift change. And I generally thought about Golden State Warriors plays, various plays that they had run in recent games. And I don't think that that's what you're supposed to do but maybe it is. And so I loved that so much. And then, um, and then that was over. And then I uh, ran into Jeff Hoyle, the clown that many people will be familiar with here, I think. And, uh, and he told me about that. He was just finishing being a visiting, uh, an, a visiting artist at this brain place at UCSF called the memory and aging center. So I got in touch with them to see if I could apply to be a visiting artist. And now and I ended up being uh, accepted into this new thing that was starting called the Global Brain Health Institute. And um, and I this is now my third or fourth year there. And so I've been just totally 
involved with studying the brain and brain science and being around people who have dementia um, and their caregivers, which is such a beautiful and underappreciated group of people. And, um, and then for me, connecting this incredible struggle that people with dementia and their caregivers go through and that the, that the researchers are going through to try to come up with a cure. And since I began my fellowship at the Gold Brain Health Institute on the same day that uh, Donald Trump was inaugurated as president, uh, I, I became sort of really, really into this idea that there was this parallel going on that in my life I was learning at this place about this horrible degenerative brain disease that involved uh, lack of communication because of blockages. And then, and then I saw our country as the, at the same way as uh, also having a kind of a political dementia and um, with, uh, and that in order to get a democracy that we needed to improve the health of our collective brain or what I call it citizen brain. So that was sort of the, the start of the peace citizen brain that I've been working on, including at the Marsh. And um, as you can tell, it's a laugh riot subject as well. So I, but I went from death to uh, subject as subject matter to dementia. So I thought that was slightly more cheerful. Do you have it a little that you might want to present of that, like two minutes or something, or the well, first? That, one? that piece is that piece is still in progress. But um, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, yes, it's an interesting challenge since I don't know how it begins or the middle or the end yet, but. Um, but, uh, I think this is the latest beginning. The latest beginning is, um, my mother was never in love, not even with me. So it begins. And then, um, oh, I, I should probably go on, but basically she was that never is, in love. That I'll is the only line I've never had, I've ever heard. Well, yeah, because it's a new piece. I don't repeat myself or other people, or I try not to. So, okay, I'll just go a little further. So basically, I'll just tell you guys. So my mom was never in love. She was, was in love with my dad. They were both communists, and um, they agreed on Stalin and stuff, but they hated each other, and they divorced when I was a kid, a well, baby. And she was never in love my whole life. My mother was never in love. She had boyfriends. She was very beautiful. Um, and had boyfriends, but was never in love. And then in her 70s, um, she's now 92. Uh, in her 70s, she saw an ad in, in, in the personal section of the Nation magazine. Uh, it was a communist widower in Chicago whose communist wife had died suddenly, and now he needed a new communist wife. <laughs> and so he sent out this uh, personals ad, you know, around the country that, you know, communist widower, uh, mid eighties seeks communist woman, seventies through a hundreds to, you know, for <laughs> long-term relationship and um, eventually marriage. And, and and she answered it, and they met each other. He was in Chicago, she was, and she moved and she gave up a rent control department in Manhattan and they got married and they fell in love. And it was an incredible love story. It was like incredibly beautiful. And then around the time that I was starting, uh, a little before I was starting uh, to work at this brain place, um, my now stepfather, uh, Frank Rosen, retired union uh, organizer, uh, had a, uh, he uh, was diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's. And so in our family, we were dealing, and with my mom, I was dealing with, this was the first, I mean, it was just so beautiful for her to be in love. And he was a great, great guy and his family was great. His kids were great. And, and now all of a sudden this was disappearing in a way. And so, so the piece that I'm doing, it, it goes back and forth between UCSF where I'm learning uh, all these various uh, things about brain science, uh, especially about the empathy circuit uh, that we can make stronger in ourselves and, uh, going back and forth between there and the self-help home in Chicago, where my mother and my stepfather were then living. So that's sort of a summary. Well, is, is he still alive? No, no, he died uh, two years ago. Um, he declined and declined and, um, um, I had this great experience. I mean, not great. But when, when Frank was moved up 
to, you know, when they have different floors at this home as they do in many places. So they were on the independent living floor. But then Frank, my mom was still fine and is still fine, you know, and all. And but Frank deteriorates to the point that he needed nursing care around the clock. So he was moved up to the nursing care floor. And then um, I was visit, And then so my so my mom was going to move from this bigger apartment that they had shared to a smaller one because it would be cheaper in the same place in the self-help home. So I was there trying to set up, um, trying to change the phone line, the, the phone account from Frank, who now had advanced dementia to my mother. So I called AT&T and uh, I said, I need to change this phone line and stuff. And they said, well, you need to answer the security question. And I said, well, I can't, I can't answer this. It's for Frank Rosen. It's for my stepfather. And I don't know what he, you was asked or what he answered and, and he wouldn't know at this point. And they said, well, you, we can't, we just, it's, we can't, the rule, those are the rules. You have to answer the security question correctly before we can change anything about the account. So I said, so, so what is the security question? <laughs> and they said this, and, 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 and so the woman said on the phone, you know, at AT&T, she said, um, who is your favorite actor? Yeah. So, so, you know, so I realized like, I just had like this one shot because I, I had a chance, you know, if I guessed correctly <laughs> that I could then change over this thing. So my mom could control the, the phone uh, account. And so I see, well, I don't know. He's a, uh, you know, he's in his eighties now, when would it have been sort of the time that he would really, Frank would have gotten into and then, and what kind of actor, probably a male actor. And then it would be someone who's like, like Frank sort of, tall and rugged, but also unexpected warmth and stuff like that. So I just went like, after like, I just went, Spencer Tracy? <laughs> and the woman on the phone said, so what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is your yeah. mom, where's your mom now? Is she still in Chicago or did she go back to New York? Uh, my, uh, no, my mom stayed in Chicago. She had given up her rent control department in New York. When you do that, they don't let you return because it's just, <laughs> it's really shutting the door on everything. So no, and she loves Chicago. They, she is still at the self-help home, which is this really incredible place on the north side of Chicago. It was set up originally for elderly Jewish refugees from fascist Europe. And um, it still has, at least as of the last time I was there, I can't visit right now as all, any, no, you know, none of us can visit those places, but um but the last time I visited the self-help home, I actually was able to have lunch with a survivor. Uh, uh, and uh, and so it's uh, it's a beautiful place with this great history. And my mother's, and Frank, when they when they joined, the, the their big worry and was, but we can't we can't eat bacon because you know they were very they're very secular. <laughs> Frank and my mom, you know, so the idea that you couldn't get bacon, especially for my mom, that was almost like you know a deal breaker. But then. People told her, like at the home, they said, you know, you can sneak in bacon. <laughs> but my mom is like learning stuff, right? Because she was, you know, raised by her parents were totally secular from Russia. From my her parents were from the same, um, by the way, the same shtetl as Chagall was from. And so all those flying ladies and cows and stuff, that's where my grandfather and grandmother came from. And they were both socialists, and they raised my mother totally secularly. And my mother raised me and my father raised me pretty much totally secularly. So my mom didn't know anything about Jewish stuff. And so, so I've learned since then, because I became friends with a rabbi and I got myself bar mitzvah and stuff. So I've learned a few things with my mom, you know, this is all new to her. So my mom will like call me and she would call me like from self-help home. She'd go, they have their Sabbath on Fridays. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> and they call it Shabbat. And they light candle, like she's talking like she's Margaret Mead, you know, amongst this incredibly, <laughs> this incredibly unusual tribe that she happens to find herself in. So um, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of delightful. Aww. Well, do you think it's time to open it up and see if anybody has any questions and you can give sure. some answers. And if nobody has any questions, we could keep talking. Anybody have any questions? Brian. Daniel, let's open it up. This could be a, a few minutes. Um, folks, we hi, this is Brian. If you've got a question, you can go ahead and wave your hands around the screen. You can type that question in the chat room. Um, just go ahead and get our attention and we'll get you unmuted and you can ask your question. 
I'll ask question. Okay. Uh, David and I are not John Belushi, John Bellucci. Oh, someone already answered you that. Different person. Uh, John Bellucci is still alive. Uh, something, 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 something. Uh, Douglas Konecki, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, you were sure it was Humphrey Bogart. I think that would have been an excellent guess. It would have been an excellent guess. But if you had been in my position and it guessed Humphrey Bogart, guess what? my mother would not have had access to that phone line. So I'm really glad I was there instead of you. And um, there's something else. I don't know, something else. Da, 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 da. Okay, anyhow, I'm, any questions? And go dubs, I appreciate the go dubs. <laughs> uh, 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 Patricia Corrigan, I see that uh, Nachas is pride and joy in Yiddish. Is that true? But don't you say of someone like of a, Ah, oh, she's got nachas. No. And why is it that someone named Patricia Corrigan knows that and someone named Josh Kornbluth story. doesn't? It's a long story. I'll tell you sometime. Okay, cool. <laughs> Am I going to take ukulele lessons? Uh, Gail asks. Uh, not imminently, um, but our son uh, is home from college, not by his choice, <laughs> with us. And he and I have been taking guitar lessons uh, online together. So uh, it's sort of ukulele-ish. Where do I live now? Oh, people are answering the questions for me. So it's Melissa uh, Nguyen, Nguyen uh, where do you live now? Uh, I live in Berkeley, as David and I answered. I live in Berkeley, uh, North Berkeley. What's the latest in brain health, Anna, Anna Marie uh, asks. Ah, oh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> And there's a lot going on, but they're working as, as everyone knows, you know, and would suspect they're working really hard to try to find a cure for dementia. But dementias are, as you probably also know, a, a, a whole collection of different diseases and they're um, including Alzheimer's, uh, but other ones as well. And they've had a lot of trouble to come up with something. Eventually, uh, my mentor, uh, the wonderful man and scientist, uh, Dr. Bruce Miller at uh, UCSF, he tells me that what will happen when there is a cure, it will probably be like what came out, what eventually came out for uh, HIV, which will be a cocktail of some sort, a mixture so that different things can be addressed. There's, there's two kinds of proteins uh, that uh, create most blockages that, uh, that lead to uh, dementia and uh, um, amyloid and tau are the two. And, and anyhow, it's, it's really complicated. I don't think I'm going to work it out myself, but um, the cool thing I do mention that's in one, one of my videos, my first video, my first citizen brain video uh, is about uh, something that neurologists discovered pretty recently, which is that empathy is a circuit in your brain. There's a circuit in your brain that, that makes empathy. They learned that because people with frontotemporal dementia uh, of a certain kind would lose their empathy. And then when they scanned their brains, they saw it was out, but it turned off. And that was uh, their empathy. So, and then, and then you, it turns out you can build up your empathy circuit as well, as I was mentioning earlier. And what I'm hoping to do is build up a national empathy circuit. <laughs> it's, it's a challenge, but um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of, uh, they're so, they work so hard. They don't go to movies or nothing. These people, these, these researchers at UCSF, they just work. Hey, Josh, some other questions question. there. Oh, sorry, Stephanie. Um, Josh, we've got a question here from Dave. I'm going to unmute him so he can ask his question. Uh, Josh, uh, yeah. what, uh, do you feel influenced your outlook on life the most? What influenced my outlook the most? Yeah. What I book? think, what book? Uh, I'm really tempted to say the Communist Manifesto but it's more of an article, isn't it? Um, I, I don't know. I will, I will mention two authors who really blew my mind when I was just sort of entering adulthood and thinking about being a writer at least. And those were Grace Paley and, um, and uh, uh, Bernard Malamud. Um, and so if I'm gonna pick uh, Grace Paley's uh, the, uh, the Little Disturbances of Man book collection, uh, kind of rocked my world. And uh, Bernard Malamud's, uh, all of his stories did, but those two are really important to me. The Bible's really good too. I learned about that lately. There's a lot of cool stuff in it. Yep. Um, 
And so um, I really got into that with my rabbi friend. And for my bar mitzvah, I had to do a, no, I'm forgetting, but the thing that you do where you recite the thing, you know, the, and you sing it, people know it and anyhow. But anyhow, uh, my thing was about uh, uh, Pinchas. I had to, no, actually I had to do a, uh, I had to talk. I had to give a talk at my bar mitzvah when I was 52 about Pinchas. And what Pinchas did was he was a zealot and he saw a Jew fornicating with a non-Jew. And so he murdered them both and then was rewarded by God with uh, the covenant of peace. And all of his descendants were rewarded with a covenant of peace. And I told the rabbi, I said, I don't think I'm on board with that. <laughs> and he said, you can say that. Your thing can be that you're against it. So yes, so uh, the, the Torah, uh, also very cool. Great, thank you. Was Jesus the original Jewish revolutionary? David says, yes, and my dad was totally into Jesus as a Jewish communist. And he had an unpublished manuscript, which I have behind me somewhere, uh, called Jesus a Marxist Manifesto. Uh, meditation, I'm sorry, not manifesto. Come on, what's the thing you say at the bar mitzvah? Lol, who knows it? We'll figure it out, Melissa. Haftorah, the Haftorah, the drash. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, actual, real Jewish people who are answering the questions I cannot answer. Um, does your wife still make all your shirts? Uh, P.S. Look at my last name. Corn blue. So we're possibly Meshpoka, Roy Corn blue. I mean, that's we're just one letter away. Uh, probably was an Ellis Island thing. And yes, my wife, Sarah, makes all of my shirts. Uh, and uh, years ago, she uh, when we first met, she was making uh, fezes. She was making fezes, but then she just felt like she had reached, hit a wall with Fed's creativity. But um, one of the her first fezes uh, ended up, she ended up giving to Marga Gomez. And uh, Marga, of course, rocked it. Uh, I'm leading the revolution of empathy. David, yes, thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, what high school did I go to? I went to the Bronx High School of Science, you know, party school. So, uh, uh, yeah, I went to the Bronx High School of Science. I actually sort of enjoyed it. Yeah. So Josh, mm -hmm. we're almost done. It's almost 830. Can you believe it? No, the time really flies by when you're, uh, sequestered in your own apartment. <laughs> <laughs> So, but let's talk about, it. so I want to just, first of all, say that next week, I hope you all join us. We're going to have Tom Amiano on. Tom Amiano? Yep. So why okay. are you watching me then? You have Tom and he has a new book. Right. Tom Amiano has. It's Kiss My Gay Ass and he's going to be on Stephanie's Marsh Stream next week. That's awesome. Isn't it? I'm not still making reads, by the way, Nikki, but I have all my equipment, if you know what I mean, to make reads. <laughs> So, oh, can I just mention also Citizen Brain? Yes. That's my series of videos that I'm making. They're free, they're online, and you can find them at citizenbrain.org. Citizenbrain.org. And uh, they're on so far in empathy, ageism, and loneliness, which came out just before this recent, these recent events. And the, the video I'm working on now, the next video will be on othering and belonging. And I'm uh, citizen, oh, thanks, moderator. Uh, citizenbrain.org. Thank you so much for joining us, but we're just also so glad you're here and we want you healthy and safe. And I'll give my final like pet peeve. If you run, please wear a mask because you're making me crazy when I walk down the street with my mask on. How's that? And all runners need to wear masks and bicycle riders. I don't know why they don't think they do, but let's keep going with this quarantine. Stay healthy, be wonderful. Come back to Marsh Stream every night at 7.30. Next week, we have Health and Healing with Sam Simon. We have so many things happening and fitness and singing and Don Reed and so much more. Please come back to Marsh Stream. Enjoy it during this time.